What up? This is Rama Screen, and in the anticipation of Bloodthirsty arriving in select theaters and on demand April 23, I'm here talking with the stars of this new horror thriller film, Lauren and Greg. How are you, Lauren and Greg? I'm great. Excellent. You? That was really good. Like that was that a hell of an awesome intro. intro. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. This is an interesting take on werewolves. Uh, some say, some could say that it's a feminist take on werewolves. The strong female presence uh, in front of and behind the cameras as well. Yeah. So for both of you, what was your reaction when you first read Wendy and Lowell's script? And the, and coming in, did you get the sense that it was going to be a different project than the previous horror films that you've done in the past? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, when I first read the script and ultimately too, for me, when I heard the music, um, I could just really see like it was so visceral this like this world um to me and it really came to life with the music as well i obviously loved that the the main character the main werewolf is female you don't see that very often i think like werewolves are inherently kind of seen as male um ginger snaps is the only one i can think of that has female werewolves so um that was very exciting to me also just, you know, being able to play a, a female lead was very exciting to me. And then also the fact that um, the main relationship in the film is a queer relationship. So as a queer woman, that was uh, very refreshing for me to see that it was done in a way that was very much just, you know, they're just lesbians and that's just how it is. It's not like the central plot of the movie. It's, uh, it's just, as, you know, the same as if they were a straight couple which was really refreshing for me. Yeah, I, um, I, the, the, when I first read the script, I thought the idea of the sacrifices that one needs to make to pursue greatness, I thought that was really, that, that was something very interesting to me. Um, and I liked it. And then I had, before this was before Lauren was attached or Amelia, so I didn't know who else was gonna be involved. And when I, and Catherine, and when I had the pleasure of meeting them and started to working, started working with them, they all had such distinct and strong voices. Um, I, I don't want to say as women, but as artists. And they, because they're younger, there was just, there was a different perspective. And I found that really refreshing. And I was impressed immensely by all of them. I mean, they, there was, particularly for Lauren, such a heavy load to carry with the singing. And, um, and you know, it's a challenging part as an actor as well. So for her to carry that off, with very little prep time and a very concentrated and condensed shooting schedule was was impressive and Amelia also I thought was was um, dynamite I I had worked with her father who's a, a mm. first AD in Vancouver a number of years ago um, and she just she was so decisive she really knew what she wanted to do she knew the limitations of of what we had time and budget wise and she was very creative didn't waste time and had interesting solutions to problems and and I like that and she was also great with the script that she would just if there was something that wasn't working or if it was a little bit too ex, uh, you know extraneous and cumbersome she just like cut it down to its essence and I think the movie moves as a result and I think it allows the suspense to breathe because it doesn't get bogged down in anything unnecessary it moves. Lauren uh, the most chilling scene for me not, not necessarily the wolf stuff but the most chilling scene for me was when you slurp or drink that raw meat blood off of that plate in that refrigerator. You yeah. got to reveal that trick for me on that because it drove me crazy. How did that work? Like, what was it made out of? Yeah. <laughs> um, so essentially, the, the meat that they had on the plate was, it wasn't real. It was made of something I think it might have been like a gelatin mold or something like that okay and the liquid I'm pretty sure was just like water food coloring some maybe some <sighs> corn syrup to make it more like blood consistency um that was one of my favorite things to shoot I'll be honest because I knew how I knew if I was watching that how grossed out I would be yeah. so um it was really fun to just like commit to that and just know that I'm gonna gross a bunch of people out <laughs> <laughs> you pulled it off really yeah. well thank you. thank you follow up on that uh, what did you think of Lowell's songs about how they were incorporated into the progression of gray 
thought it was beautiful. Um, yeah, like I said, it's one of the things that sold me on the film. The songs are haunting and beautiful and her lyricism is amazing. I still sing them sometimes. They'll just like, I feel like I'll have dreams where they're just, they'll oh. just pop into my head. <laughs> uh, so they really get under your skin um, and stay with you. And I haven't really seen a movie like this before that's not a musical you know, but incorporates several songs like written for the movie into the movie in such like a seamless way. Um, and yeah, I mean, it just like Greg was just saying in another interview, it's it really, there's this purity that comes with it of, you know, the fact that it's not like this performative, like kind of musical, but it's just actually a real person singing these songs. And I think that really helps the audience like see gray and connect with gray on like a deeper personal level. Um, and so then it's even more kind of jarring when, when she transforms into this monster. Um, well, yeah, it was, it was an amazing experience. Thank you for sharing that. Both of you, yeah. Greg and Lauren, uh, I mean, a lot of folks have played werewolves over the years, you know, Jack Nicholson and Benicio del Toro among them. So you have joined their ranks. You're in good company. <laughs> uh, so we got to talk about the prosthetics or the special effects makeup, though. Um, how, was that challenging? How many hours did you have to sit through that? I mean, was it comfortable or uncomfortable? Did it feel hot? Can you talk to me about that? I mean, A, it was amazing. And the people um, doing the work on the prosthetics and the makeup were fantastic. Mm. We were also doing it in the most fascinating boudoir I've ever been in my life. <laughs> The, the, I wonder the, if you were going to bring that up. The house that we were staying, we shot everything in one house. And it was a very interesting gentleman who had specific tastes. And his room was a room that was in the mood for love. So yeah. I'll I put mean, it that way. Yeah, it was a fascinating place to spend hours getting werewolf makeup put on. Um, but I think there's something that appeals to both our sense of play as kids, this idea of becoming something else. But there's also something real about it, even though the makeup is is obviously fake, but it's on a human body. And and I think that we res respond to that as a viewer differently than if it was just CGI. Um, I again, I, I know that the technology has come a long way, and CGI is you know a, such a big part of so many movies. But to me, something real always wins and even if it's more rudimentary we we respond to it because we're sentient space occupying beings and we want that in our reality so i think that it, it added to it and as an actor when you put that on and you look at yourself in the mirror um and you take a million selfies and then you go shoot it's uh it's <laughs> That's the, yeah. it's like if some guys get like you know with midlife crisis time you get like this sports car or whatever but I decided as well to become a werewolf from a midlife crisis and it's really it's working out very well. <laughs> and for you, Lauren, <laughs> or people should do that as their midlife crisis. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. As Greg said, like um, <laughs> this, the space that we were in when we were getting the makeup done was just. I feel like no one should ever do werewolf makeup in a normal room ever again like it has to be it has to be a boudoir to set the tone but um but yeah for me too it was like it was very awesome as an actor to actually have those practical effects on my body um it just brings you that much more into the character you know I mean as actors our job is to make things look seem as real as possible so that always helps um being able to yeah look at myself in the mirror and really you know, in between scenes, you might have some break for like switching up lighting or camera positions or whatever it is. And you kind of get out of that space a little bit. So it made it really easy to just jump back into it because I could just go and look at myself in the mirror and I'd be right back there. Um, yeah, yeah, it was it was great. And the, the makeup artists were out of this world. Yeah, and finally, on a deeper level, you know, um, uh, Gray's uh, creative process, you know, uh, the struggle between staying true to your art and meeting the demands of Vaughn, you know, changes, whatever changes that may be. Uh, can you share, you know, as artists yourselves, have you ever ha uh, experienced having to choose between integrity and compromise? And what did you do ultimately in that situation? 
Uh, yeah, I, you know, I think that I, I've become more of a bastard the older I get, and I, I think it's served me better. I think as a young artist and, and feeling insecure in the industry, and you always want to please everybody, and you're so uh, neurotic and insecure that when I say bastard, I don't mean to people around the work. I mean to be ruthless in the work and take whatever time and space you need to own it and do the best work possible. And, you know, my sons and my daughter are young actors on the way up. And I think that's the one thing I've tried to, to teach them is that you, you be incredibly gracious with people around the work, always in the makeup show, everybody. I mean, we're all working together. We're all pulling in the same direction. There's no need to ever be abusive or dismissive of, of, of anybody. But at, when it's time to work, whatever you need to do to get to a place where you're honest and you can reveal yourself, you have to do that because there's no, there's no consolation prize. You don't get a participation ribbon for pleasantness. You either deliver in the moment or you don't. And I think that's kind of the, and sometimes there's a, there's a toll that comes with that. But if you choose this life, you have to choose it fully and you have to allow yourself to be authentic and to be, proud of of the stuff you do as opposed to um selling yourself out for fear of offending somebody i think one of the main things that drew me to this film was the more i thought about kind of gray's transformation scene and how you know the transformation scene is such a big deal and represents so much i i thought a lot about like what is transforming and and why is that such a big deal to people and I was like why do I feel that way and then I thought I think it's because as as women um I'm, I'm constantly transforming myself like in every situation you know like even today just being here I'm I'm transforming myself in a way of you know how am I supposed to act how am I supposed to look all these all these different things I'm very very used to that as a woman I'm constantly transforming myself um, so yeah, I, I, I think, um, I'm kind of losing my train of thought here. Sorry. <laughs> no um, what was, what was your last question? Uh, artist integrity what was my and point here? Artist integrity. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I think that I've kind of learned from that. I need to stop constantly transforming who I am to kind of fit what I think is expected of me all the time. You know, there's, there's times when obviously like, like Greg is saying, you want to always be, be so gracious to all these amazing people that are making this art with you. But at the same time, you also need to listen to yourself and know when it's a time to um, just tell all that shit to shut up and just um, be true to yourself. And that's kind of what I'm realizing, I think, as an artist in the past couple of years of my career, which is, you know, better late than never, but um, <laughs> a little later than I would have hoped. But I think uh, I think I've kind of learned a, a bit from this this film, too, of, um, you know, how, how far will you go for your art kind of thing. Thank you for sharing that. For my fans at home, everybody go check out Bloodthirsty arriving in theaters and on demand April 23. Lauren and Greg, thank you for talking to me. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks, Rama.